Okay, welcome everyone to Sound Advice 3, it's part of the Architecture Foundation's 100 Day Studio. Um, I guess when we first conceived this, we assumed the government wouldn't have like just allowed everyone to do whatever they wanted at this point. But as you look down from walking down Bethnal Green High Street, where our local trainer shop is now reopened, um, <laughs> lockdown is officially over. So thank you everyone for joining us, even though you can do whatever you want in the UK now. Um, and it is great um, for us to come back, also to change the format slightly with some guests. Um, but Pooja and I are gonna start by introducing a bit of what sound advice is, what we're gonna discuss today. And then we'll talk a bit more about um, our guests. So let me just share the screen. This is the bit where, here we go. Okay, so. Hey, thanks Joe. Uh, so yeah, sound advice. I guess Joseph and I sort of created this platform as a, uh, as an, a place where we both can sort of talk about inequality and inequality in the built environment. We both are architects and urbanists and have worked in the public sector and the private sector and always trying to kind of find how we can um, talk about these things that can often be quite contentious and quite provocative. So we talk about things and we also play music to sort of lighten the tone perhaps. Uh, and also we think that music is quite a good way to express some of the things that can sometimes be quite emotional. That is quite an unattractive screenshot of me. Thanks, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so? So tip number one is get your nani to do the 2C slide. Nani meaning uh, grandma in Hindi. And um, we were, I guess we we're interested in how culture is moving or shifting or has been forced to move into a digital realm. And I guess it brings up questions um, around how physical spaces are sort of, and their associated behaviours can be mirrored in a digital space. Um, and the sort of social norms that we have don't necessarily disappear because you're in sort of a new sort of more egalitarian um, platform. And in fact, what a lot of these social norms instead can get amplified or heightened. Um, and one of these social norms, I guess, we can talk about is actually inequality and racism is actually uh, in, it can be considered a social norm and these things also can be more impactful and, um, and have also take a presence here. We've seen that in social media, but also um, in this events and this sort of needs when people troll events, this sort of um, um, uh, straight way people drop into like uh, existing social norms is a way of like hurting or, or trolling people. Um, and that, I guess, was, is interesting to us because it's like, how is, can we use a digital space to actually change the way or some of the people's social behaviours? As we question the way that um, uh, sort of societal structures digitally actually there's an opportunity to improve them rather than allow them to be amplified um, in a negative way. So, yeah, I guess today we're just going to talk about those themes that Joseph touched on, but also sort of who actually has accessibility to, you know, the Internet, to computers, uh, how digital literacy works. I think often we can just take it for granted that we can just join, people can just join a Zoom meeting. Uh, and, yeah, kind of conspiracy theories, data collection, all of this stuff, but always bringing it back to how that, uh, what how our experience is in this kind of mirrored digital space and how that reflects similar experiences in the city and in architecture. Yeah, and it's quite interesting having a uh, conversation with a charity in North Woolwich that we work with. And um, the, uh, they wanted to move all their programs digitally, but people in the community literally didn't have computers and literally didn't have the internet. So these are sort of infrastructures that are important. And I guess it goes to the question of if water and other things are deemed as essential, then now would we consider internet and access to the digital realm as part of a, a, a public right, I guess. Um, and then this is an opportunity to introduce our guests. Um, so um, our first guest is Akil Scave-Smith, is a designer and one third of Resolve Collective, an interdisciplinary design collective that combines architecture, engineering, technology, and art to address social challenges. Additionally, he was also one of the founding associates of Public Practice, where he, lent, where he led on the Meanwhile strategy within Croydon's placemaking team. Um, and A Vibe Called Tech is an initiative founded by our guest Charlene Fempe that seeks to encourage public institutions to actively consider the impact 
of technological developments on the black community. A vibe called Tech has hosted panel discussions at the Barbican that has explored um, whether advancements in technology can provide a more level playing field for creatives of colour and hosted workshops at the Tate, uh, one of which featured Ada, the world's first ultra-realistic AI humanoid robot artist. So welcome both of you. Um, and then we're going to start off with our first song, is a choice by Pooja, um, and she can explain why she uh, picked it. Yeah, I guess it was just sort of, I feel like we're in this weird space where everything we were doing physically, like, I don't know, yoga classes or uh, these kind of talks have all become sort of online spaces. And I was thinking quite hard about like, how is music being shared online? Uh, and this is this amazing sort of battles that are going on at the moment between different artists where they just spend quite a long time just playing back to back music. And we've got two absolute legends here, Eric Badu and Joel Scott playing music back to back. And it just, it's just a combination of them talking, them playing music, Music and then the sort of chat that's happening side by side that just it's just great so here we go I think what's also interesting just about this is how Erica Badu I guess has always been a bit of a visual artist and I guess the like ability to express herself in a visual and musical way is really great because a lot of her music has been like that so it's worth checking out a lot of her music videos after this um and we go to the next tip Yeah. That's my... you, are, you are muted for a bit a there? Classic. No. Rearrange your bookshelf to make sure why I'm no longer talking to white people about race is out of view. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this um, theme is about digital inequality. Um, I guess that alludes to the fact that people's bookshelves and backdrops have become a part of them, a part of their like digital brand. Um, and sort of like, actually I've noticed myself like making sure the, that when I'm um, in a meeting, um, the, the, the the things behind me like uh, what well, I want to project into the world because suddenly people have this like um, quite intimate ability to see what who you are and where you live and in in, uh, or in your house basically and I guess it's interesting to think about how we potentially take things for granted that you know you can get onto Zoom um, and alluding to a point earlier there's like physical infrastructure involved to actually be able to like use this medium and have access to these things um, and it's interesting when you thinking about um, an organization like Magpie in Newham, where um, a lot of the women that work for that charity don't have any um, right to public recourse. They also can't actually get access to, they can't like set up a Virgin Media account. So a lot of the information they might require, which is all now moved digitally, they physically can't get access to. And I guess information is actually quite an important currency in the digital realm, in the physical realm, in the digital realm as well. Um, and again, it's interesting to think about how, um, yeah, this idea that people are now always in your house or like your work and home life has suddenly like been um, banished. Um, and then it's, it's an, an interesting, I guess, then picking what backdrops or virtual backdrops you might actually use to, again, to change where you are. So of course we use James Terrell today, but it's actually interesting also now that teams have that, um, seeing all these different people at City Hall changing their backdrops. And they, a lot of them are like sort of, of like um, of London backdrops that like, signify the fact they work at City Hall and they're like these new surroundings. So it's quite interesting to see that sort of um, an additional layer of like um, curation of your, of your life. Yeah, Charlene, you must have quite a lot of sort of experience in this sort of idea of the kind of currency and signifiers online. Yeah, I think. Um... I think the whole background um, issue is a more serious one than we realise. Because I think when you, um, when you go into work, it's not right, it shouldn't have to be the case, but often like as people of colour, we have to code switch. And like, we go in, maybe we'll speak differently, um, how we dress might be different, um, how we behave might have like these slight changes. And then suddenly you've got this situation where everyone's in your home. And so the kind of ability to code switch is kind of taken away to some extent. And also you're not the only person, like often you're not the only person in your home, right? So you might be like having a conversation like I'm having now. Luckily, like my kid is sleeping, but like my kid could have, like, come out from the back and then like I might speak to them like in a different language. And suddenly it becomes apparent that I've got this whole other culture. 
um, or like my mum might be screaming in the background in like some deep Ghanaian accent and then there's like, like that to contend with on the call and I might speak to her in a particular way usually which I can't adapt just for this conversation. Um, so the reality of who you are and all of those nuances like oh your like literally are oh, your background <laughs> your background is suddenly apparent to all of your colleagues in a way that you might not feel comfortable with or you feel like might act as a way of kind of reducing your worth at work mm. so it, yeah i think like everyone's messing around like with backgrounds like they're fun and they are like i love james Terrell. um i was self isolating in the james Terrell museum just before lockdown in Argentina. It's great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other story, right? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that would have made for an interesting backdrop. Um, but like as much as it's all like fun to play with, actually like the level of anxiety, it can be like it's causing with some people, um, I think needs to be addressed, especially this is going to be a long-term way of us working. But I guess the background is one sort of tool in a sense but do you think there's other behaviors that we sort of are kind of touching on in this sort of digital world um that's being is there like a different way generally we need to behave online or are we experiencing things in a different way yeah i think there's a whole thing right around like i suppose like the politics of respectability and Suddenly, online, there are like very fixed ways that you think you need to behave in order to be vanilla enough to not cause yourself trouble in the future. Um, and I think, again, that's becoming more and more intense. At the, it's always been the case, but I think it's becoming more and more intense in lockdown when all of our interactions are online and people are having to like search for you before they have a conversation with you in a meeting, so on and so forth. Um, and it's about, I think, who chooses what those values are? Like what is the right way of presenting yourself, both kind of visually and in terms of what information is available for you, or like on you, should I say, online? Um, I think especially lots of younger people, I think they're terrified about presenting like what their real music tastes are or what their real opinions are on particular things. Like I find myself that if I'm doing something like this, which I know is recorded, um, like, I don't rein myself in that much, but you have to think twice about what you're going to say um, yes. because it's going to be there forever in a way that you wouldn't necessarily in a conversation that you were having with someone obviously that wasn't in digital space. Mm. So the level of surveillance um, that's taking place, I think is really shifting how we behave. Um, and then we need to start asking questions about who's deciding what's okay. Yeah, and I guess, um, at the same time, I'm, I'm interested in whether there's opportunities for this, uh, I guess, the theme that you took from the, in the, at the Barbican, whether some of this can start to level the playing field a bit, um, in the sense that I wonder whether there's a lot of people can like hide, literally hide at work, whereas actually it feels like there's a sort of like exposing of what people can actually um, contribute to organisations coming. And I guess it, it could be, in a weird way, an opportunity to level the playing field a bit. I'm trying to think of like, I'm always trying to like search for a bit of positivity in the <laughs> <laughs> in the world of technology because oh. it's like a very negative but I wonder whether there is a positive something positive I, can come out of this I think I think definitely like my general vibe is that um there's lots of positives to be taken out of tech and but we just have to like work a bit harder mm. um to dig them out and like make use of them so like um when we did those talks when we did like that talk at the Barbican it was very much about how it was like creative access, right? And that how technology is giving everyone the opportunity to like make films or produce art in a way and then distribute it um, without necessarily going through the gatekeepers that they had to go through before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there is like a lot to be said for that. Um, and it's, it can be and will continue to be a really positive force. Um, but Joseph, like the points you're making before though, is like even with that comes the assumption of like what, tools people have access to mm. so like you're not going to be able to make anything if you don't have a microphone if you don't have a laptop if you don't have like some of the basics that are required mm. um to produce but another thing i think is important about this kind of level playing field of digital is um it's about kind of time and physical space so before i could again just because i know you say we could do what we want but we're still in lockdown in many ways and there's very few other places we can go and sit 
Mm. So like, if you want to work, you're going to have to work within the confines of your home for now. Right. So there's always been that problem that like time is like the great feeder of creativity. And so, which is why like a lot of people who are well off, like get to go down that route of like being authors or being musicians because they've had all the time in the world to develop their practice. Um, but now we're in a position where you might have people who are in homes where there's like they're overcrowded and they physically haven't got the space to create. So mm. even if they've got their laptop, they can't like sit down and write because there's like X person kind of like coming into the living mm. room or like Y person like in their bedroom. Um, so though there is more access, I worry that like they don't have the space to go outside and create there, like with their people, with their friends, with their community. Um, they're stuck indoors with their screen, even if they have that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Cause I think it, um, I'm always interested in this idea that like, digital requires quite a lot of physical infrastructure to, to facilitate it. Mm. And it isn't the case that it's like this kind of ethereal thing that doesn't exist. It like, relies on you know, the ability to like own a laptop, have decent internet speed. Actually where optical fiber broadband is put in the city is also very much based on employment and investment cases to actually decide to dig up a road and lay like 5G broadband. So it's actually interesting to see who does get 5G coverage and who doesn't, who does have optical fiber access, who doesn't. Um, and I think these are questions that sort of, um, the physicalness of the digital realm, I think is, is an interesting um, discussion to have. And then another thing that's been interesting is seeing like the people who do and don't have like offices in their homes. Oh, like, oh, yeah. uh, that's like one of the most interesting things and like again this because this is recorded i probably shouldn't say this but as the grade level goes up the city at the chile the more likely <laughs> it is that someone will be like zooming from a private office <laughs> than if you're like lower down and it is like a literal like uh, representation of like um like career successes whether someone has their own office or not in their home to be able to like um work from during lockdown so the experience of working from home is so different depending on what your home is I literally mm. yeah i think like work i was gonna say that like, working from home like i live in a um i live in a flat which is like one big space so there's no real separate like at the time i was like great like architecture this is really interesting right <laughs> lockdown now i realized it was a big fat mistake <laughs> uh, because there is like no room to like be on your own um and like the and the, but it's actually quite a large space but like mentally it's really stressful to like not have that separation between like work um and like my personal life um and I worry how that's going to affect people's um right word how well people are delivering how like and like then how they're going to be judged about how well they're doing at work like that person with an office mm. is set up environmentally to like produce better work than someone who isn't, and someone who isn't li li like living under crowded circumstances. Mm. Um, so what's already a, like quite an imbalanced playing field, and mm. what might get more so with those kind of, yeah, those environmental elements affecting it. Mm. Yeah, it's I, I don't know what you think, Akil, is in terms of like how you think different people are experiencing lockdown in a different way in terms of like young people versus old people versus in in, in relation to this uh, discussion around creativity mm. I, I think um well i mean like definitely that that kind of inequity that you guys have been talking about is is really key in how people are experiencing the different thing but I, also i guess the interesting thing for me um, is that young people, let's say, let's pick a demographic, like young people are experiencing it differently in different places. Young people in Scotland are experiencing, experiencing it differently to here, experiencing it differently to Germany, experiencing it differently to in Jamaica uh, or, or Miami when I, kind of, when, I, when, I, um, when I go and check on my, my niece and nephew. So it's like that, the, the experience of a lockdown, far from being a, something ubiquitous, is actually super, super varied. Um, and it's like, and, and that for me, kind of like, highlights how intimate our, our relationship with the government is. You kind of don't think of a government, it's only now in times of crisis where you think of a government as being so intimately connected to your ins and outs and your kind of behaviours, how you access the, the internet, how you, what, what your room looks like, what your, what your at home office looks like. It affects all these really intimate parts of your behaviour, which is crazy. Um, and it's like, it takes a crisis to really reveal that or to reveal the, the lack of, 
which is our case at the moment. But I, I find it so interesting when um when you played the Erica Badu and the um and uh, Jill Scott um uh, clash. So all my Jamaicans in the crowd will know about the Beanie Man Bounty Killer clash a couple of weeks ago, and them two were in the same room with their daughters and their family and with a bunch of other people in the whole room, um, and. It was great, and, and Jamaica are in lockdown. Um, the, their lockdown just looks very different to our lockdown, as does America's lockdown, as does whoever's lockdown. So, it's, I think it's really interesting. Like, yeah, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard for me to tell. I could I see young people out and about right now. I'm sure they're having a mixed time. Some, you know, like I'm sure some people who, who are actually missing some aspects of school and like sort of like seeing their friends in that way other people are very much doing their own thing but like the the experience seems to me like super variated mm. i guess like if, before we move on just the last point to make around this is touching on something good about technology uh, is the fact that you have been able to share this experience with friends and family all over the world, it's more likely for uh, people like us who are first, second, third, fourth generation um, yeah. people living in all over the world. My family are all over the world. My um, my mom is actually in the house at the moment, and she, you know, it's hilarious. She's like able to watch me do this talk now, uh, sitting in India in her, you know, in the living room, and that's something that wouldn't be possible uh, mm. if if it wasn't for technology. So. On, on, on that note, let's move to the next one. Um, Charlene, this is your choice. Do you want to explain uh, why you picked it? Um, this video amuses me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, I kind of felt like going for the, mo like the most literal, um, like, manifestation of how I'm feeling right now about our government, um, about the kind of brutality that's taking place in the black community. Um, and yeah, this is, this represents that to me, it always has done. Um, though it also makes me smile, which is nice, because at the moment you need to grin at some point. So yeah. Yeah, um, so let's play this song. We'll pause it there, um, but it's an amazing video. Also my fact checker in the house has just reliably informed me that it was directed by Spike Lee, which I actually didn't know that. I did not know that. Ah. Was that Jaden? What did you say about that? <laughs> yeah, it was the soundtrack to do the right thing. It was yeah, it was the soundtrack to do the right thing, which I, I knew. Right, I didn't realize. Oh, of it was course. Video, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another, another random fact is that Spike, or maybe everyone else knew this, and I just didn't. Spike Lee's dad was a music supervisor on that. They apparently he's a musician. And his sister sings as well. She sang um, some of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The super, like, oh, let's call Spike Lee right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's also amazing seeing like the last dance of Spike Lee and Michael Jordan given. This, I guess, touches on what Akil was saying earlier. We're suddenly in this position where uh, I guess government, the police, people know what we're doing. It's like, what is our sort of individual freedom as everything is sort of going online? We're being this sort of new NHS tracker. Terrifying. Is it? Is it not? I don't know. Um, question, what, what do we think about this? Well, how does it impact um, the BAME community? Oh, okay, the tracker. Like, let's like the basic problem with the tracker is it doesn't work, right? So, like, <laughs> just, like just on a really simple level, it's useless. Um, like, the secondary problem with the tracker um, is actually less about how it's going to police the BAME community and more about how the lack of trust between us and like governmental institutions means that even if they did manage to pull their fingers out and make it work, we wouldn't use it anyway, right? It's um, completely voluntary. And like, I don't know anyone, including myself, who would choose to be tracked around like my like goings and comings <laughs> by like our government, because I don't trust, A, they even know how to use the data properly or how to like stop using it or what they're gonna do with it. Like when, once this kind of COVID lockdown's over, but why, um, why would you be more resistant to that versus like using Google Maps or, you know, our phones are on all the time? There's a kind of question of like who, you know, who is tracking you at all points. 
I think for me, it's because the government specifically, they, they don't have a framework for how the data is going to be used in the future. There are no rules that they can't change. And so that's what terrifies me. They, mm. like, they could collect anything that they want now and then be like in, I don't know, five years time that we've still got this information and we're going to use it for X. Like with private companies, there's much more, there's better limitations on like what they can use and how long they can use it for. Um, I just, I actually just trust the government less. I don't, not that I'm saying I trust Google or I trust Facebook or um, that they're doing everything perfectly, but I trust them more than I trust the government. Yeah, I think it's also like one of those things where it takes a long time to build trust up in communities. And I guess if you're not proactively trying to build that trust, it makes it hard for people to engage, especially when a lot of the, I guess, policy um, positions over the last 10 years have been, um, you know, I guess the thing I've been thinking about a lot is until you hear the phrase, this, will, this policy will disproportionately affect game communities doesn't exist anymore. I guess a lot of these issues we're seeing are actually by design and people are aware of the impact. Um, so like, you know, the Public Health England um, lockdown, a lot of that had a negative impact because of the, the roles and the, um, so there's a fly attacking me, the roles that um, people, the BAME people in our society have. Um, and there's an aware, there probably was an awareness in the modeling that key workers were still exposed to, to greater risk. Um, so the actual lockdown policy of having certain, you know, industries, um, transport going and people now to use them, they knew probably knew how to have a negative impact on certain communities. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's very hard then to turn around and say, well, you need to use this system, which is based on trust and your trust in us essentially is the system that we need to use to get out of this mess. Um, I guess it's, if the, I guess it's hard to then suddenly build that trust overnight when it's in probably a lot of everyone's interest to use it, even though um, people might not feel like it's something that they want to engage with. I think mm. that, as well as the fact, I think I'm not sure of the stat whether it's 52 or 54 but percent more um, like BAME people have been fined for COVID, mm. like for COVID 19 related, um, mm. like again, for like COVID 19 related laws. So that you're right, like A, that kind of design that they did um, about like who does and doesn't go to work. They, they must have modeled it and known that we'd be like more heavily affected. But then separate to that, when it comes to policing, mm. like all of the laws around mm. COVID, once again, like there's a history of it, like with stop and search, like how like, like can they use force to their discretion? Like this is just like another example of how we're being kind of disproportionately affected. And so like knowing all of those things, yeah, it would be an absolute madness to be like jumping to sign up to this, um, to sign up to this app. But then the sad thing about that is that we do need to be extra vigilant about COVID because we're dying in um, mm. much bigger numbers, um, but we're going to be too scared to use the tools that are meant to help us. Akia, how, how do you think um, this sort of translates to kind of public space? in terms of uh, the kind of individual right versus like something like digital face recognition mm. uh, and, and, and even protests, for example, yeah. how, how as designers and architects should we be thinking about this? Well, I, I mean, I think it's interesting because, uh, I mean, I'm going to segue back to Charlene's point in a second, but I think in terms of protest, there's two, the, the spectrum, protests exist on a spectrum at the moment. So earlier in the year, a few months ago, there were the protests in San Francisco about how they're dealing with the homelessness and that was a car protest. So everyone was in their car in order to protest and they blocked the road and they did this kind of thing. Now we can see with the riots in Minnesota and around America in response to what's happened, um, you know, that, that it's social distancing isn't, is no longer a thing. Um, so, like, I think there's also something about the severity of people's conditions. And, you know, there's lots of, I think there's also been lots of written about this. Normally, it's about the African continent. Um, I think it applies exactly to the Caribbean as well about, you know, um, social distancing and, and being a privilege and, um, and, and, and that kind of thing, being a privilege, that especially works in, like, the global south and better commons. Um, but then to segue back to... Um, the thing about facial recognition and the NHS app and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there was a, really, there was a landmark um, article in Wired in 2017. Maybe some of, some of you have read it. It was really big. It was all about um, China's social credit scheme, the social credit 
rating scheme. Do you, yeah. I remember that when so they released the thing where they, they needed people to sign up for it. It was it was voluntary, and then by the end of this year, it'll stop you voluntary. You have to do it, um, and you get rated based on a number any number of things. They, they correlate. They, they kind of triangulate tons of data, and, and and they use that in order to um, to give you a rating, like how you live your life. Um, and so the article was going into the depths of that. They were kind of calling it Big Brother esque. But one of the things that will have never left, never will never leave me, having read that article, is the final point was that in the the West, in the UK and the US, more information on us exists than in, than, than than exists for people in China. Um, so they, for example, um, Facebook can recognise people, um, so they can recognise who you are with an eighty three percent accuracy based on your clothes. So not based on your, without oh, wow. seeing your face. Facebook can do it without seeing it. That's, this is as of 2017. Another one is that, you know, per 100 people, it's like 30 per 100 people here as opposed to anywhere else um, are, have connected devices. You know, if, if you were to triangulate someone's credit score with um, their, um, their kind of bank statements with their name or their kind of date of birth, you can, you can access any piece of information from the person. Like it, it does, it, it literally like, it's very, um, I think we, we, we see some of these things coming from the government as a threat to our security, but the threat exists because that data exists elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And all it really takes is for someone to triangulate that. So translating that back into the, into the public sphere, into how people interact there, really, uh, you know, really, I, <laughs> I think we need to be careful about these big companies. It's like, again, like even this morning, so Twitter have now started um, censoring, um, so as, as well as flagging that you know the whole thing that Donald Trump's been kind of up in arms about the um, the, um, the the fact checking that they're doing. They've also they also censor um, comments that are passed. They censor comments that aren't um, in relation to like their their bylaws, basically. Let's say, but they they do it for high profile comments. So they don't do it for every comment. Um, so Donald Trump's comment, which was abhorrent about the riots, um, got censored by Twitter. Um, a, a comment I saw yesterday, which was a very similar thing about like invoking violence against black people, didn't get censored, and it had 20 likes, so it didn't get censored. Um, and I think the problem problem is not the problem is not that Twitter are choosing to do something about this thing now. The problem is that the act of censorship, um, the act of censorship, uh, so, um, kind of communicates a moral authority that Twitter don't have. That Twitter, multi-billion pound Twitter, Twitter harborer of, of, of racist, discriminatory sentiment for, from, for, for the last decade, do not have. Neither does any company that tries to maximize shareholder value. No company has that. So I think whilst our governments are proving themselves to be completely inept and kind of void of any, you know, any competence, um, the, the, the potentiality of a government um, is very real, you know, that the, 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 they, what they owe is to, their, to, the, to the citizens. Mm. The, the problem is that, like, companies, nowhere did it state that a company does. So it's not, Twitter can't be the moral authority because Twitter have to be. Never, never do they have to be. As soon as it stops being in their financial interest to be moral, they will. And an example of, uh, like, how that censorship will switch on emancipatory speech rather than just on kind of speeches that technically hits their bylaws is when we mention things like Palestine, is when we mention things like Black Lives Matter, things that have violence written into their scheme, right? Things that have violence like in their, in, 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 in their, in, um, in their antecedent situation, like they're born, a situation born out of violence in which violence can, can't be um, uh, removed from the description of that situation. Mm. That's when you'll find that we're being censored like high surprise, you know what I mean? Like the grin, is that kind of grinning fox parable? Yeah, you no, know, Twitter yeah. aren't your friends. Twitter will censor you. TikTok censored the Black Lives Matter hashtag yesterday. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I do, um, yeah, I don't, tr don't, don't get me wrong, I don't trust this government, but I, I really, really don't trust companies. I think that, um, I'm just, um, thinking about time, that yeah. kind of makes me laugh. Is that a lot of the like lazy racial tropes get like embedded into like digital software and thing, this um, coding. 
So like the fact that like a lot of facial recognition, recognition software, literally thinks all black people look the same, which is like <laughs> something that people like always throw out there. Are you all look alike? And then literally the, like the police facial recognition, facial recognition has exactly the same like lazy biases, like just like somehow coded into them. They couldn't be bothered to like actually like put the effort into like get enough black people to like go through the system to like model it. Is it guess another example is that actually they don't use mm. or think about our communities when it comes to actually like developing this software um, but I hate to be the like person to push like the, the, the discussion on but we have to move on to the next tune but Pooja I know you want to come in it's your tune actually okay oh, yeah. okay so um the song I picked is uh actually I won't tell you what the song is but I picked the video because I think it's an amazing example I guess of surveillance and people being captured um and this kind of ability that the most of like the world has been like captured by the like google maps and this music video, I guess, takes a bit of a, a satirical look at that. Um, but I will apologise for the um, explicit language ahead of time, just in case there's children in the room. So, <laughs> jeez. <laughs> what a banger, my word. <laughs> my word. Um, I just feel that's one of the best videos. Like, Vin Staples is another artist who, these music videos are always, like, highly conceptualised well put together and I think that was like, one of the best examples I guess of like how you can accidentally get caught out on Google <laughs> on Google Street View um, <laughs> and also the idea that like everything is like somehow captured in so many ways um, so uh, okay time for the next tip okay no need to oh actually it's different on the screen delete Amazon Prime no need to make Jeff Bezos richer use the money for something else I guess this was thinking about, uh, there's been quite a lot of chat about how there's been quite a positive kind of community move in current times. Uh, people talking to their neighbours, uh, sort of mutual aid coming to people's rescue, not dumbing coming, so we're not going to go there. <laughs> uh, and I guess this was more pointed towards you really, Akil, is um, with all the incredible work you do with working with local communities in as part of your like critical process what do you like do you see this as a kind of positive move um like what we're learning now do you think that's going to sort of continue in the future about like the about uh, digital access and, and not necessarily about digital access about like how communities are kind of coming together right 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 or you can be really cynical about it. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be. Cynical. No, you can be. I, I sort of flip back and forth about. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be cynical about it. I think. Um, uh, it, I think it's it, it's quite difficult. I think I think it's quite difficult for the same reasons that it's really difficult to draw anything from this period right now, um, until like the dust has really settled. Um, for example, like I find it really you know, the, the, the community bonds that have come together through mutual aid groups and through this and through that. Um, like, a, 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 any, any, any sociologist would tell you that, that it, um, it's like premature data, right? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's not yet qualified um, for, because we're, we're still in it. You know, we're, we're still observing what's going on and we're still in it. Like, my, my mutual aid group on my road has turned into a snitching network. The other day, someone had like a big thing on the park and it's, and, and it's, this is, you know, this is everyone's. Don't get me wrong, like, you can raise your hand in the group if your mutual aid group in your local block or neighbourhood has turned into a snitching network. That's exactly what mine have been. Yeah. Like, this, someone produced like a three-page report with a Google Maps satellite thing about people having things in the, uh, like, in parties in the park. So I think, you know, things have yet to turn and longevity is something that really does speak volumes about how people come together and that's not to be critical about how community come together because community have come together in fantastic ways you know absolutely amazing ways um time and time and again um over the o over over the crisis in order to kind of to help one another but i do i do feel like it's perhaps too l l early to learn any solid lessons from that mm -hmm. you know like i we've we, we're doing a project at the moment in croydon and we're um we're working on a, um, a digital platform to, that engages people through lack of physical engagement. So people are able to kind of submit their memories about this place and that kind of like, um, and also written, written text and a bunch of different things. There's a website that allows you to do that. Um, but one of the things I, I kind of forewarned and we were developing this was that the character that 
we're looking for a character assessment of this area from people, a people-led character assessment of the area. But it will be different because an area's character is 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 fundamentally is is is, is um is, is hinged on how people are using it. And if people are using it differently, that the character that you're going to pick up is going to change. An area isn't a um um a kind of it, it's, it's not like an objective area. It's like Streatham isn't an objective place. Streatham exists as it's performed by its inhabitants. And if we're doing, if, if we can't go Winehouse, if you can't go Bingo, then Streatham's going to change. The, the Streatham we're picking up is going to be a different Streatham. Um, and it's, you know, for better and for worse. So I think it's important to that. And I, to, for, for that, and I know it's a bit of a complicated answer. Like I wish I could say yes or no, but like no. I, do, I am finding that we are in, you know, so early in the process at the moment, even though it feels like we're about to leave lockdown come Monday. Um, you know come I mean? now. <laughs> yeah, come now. Come now, actually. Come yeah. now. Yeah, I'm still mourning the loss of um, Streatham Zap Zone. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I guess also I feel like people might be like learning the wrong things from the examples that we're seeing around community mobilisation. So I feel like there's not that much critical thinking about it. It's like, oh, isn't it great how the community's banded together to provide food for people in destitution? And rather than being like, why are people in destitution in like the, one of the richest cities in the world? Yeah. It's like, let's give them, let's like support like charitableness more. And actually I feel mm. like the whole point of this is that we shouldn't be relying on charities at this moment to feed like children, like ultimately. Mm. And I feel like there's a bit, once, my worry is at how, which point do you jump in and say, actually it isn't that great that we're having to like mobilize food, like emergency food and resilience networks in London, which is like arguably the richest city in the world. And actually, yes, it's great that people have like stepped in to provide that support, but ultimately it shouldn't need to be there in the first place. Mm. So rather than like, how do you provide more support? How do you eradicate the need in the first place? Mm. Like, I, why I completely agree. It's like, being, sorry. Yeah. No, it's, it's always that tension, isn't there, between the kind of grassroots like versus top down. But if you rely too much on localism, it's basically the state also stepping back saying, this is not our responsibility. Mm. Uh, and it, and therefore it does become a charity and this is a sort of tension that we i think with what we do it's always a constant conversation about sort of community-led regeneration versus kind of top-down planning it's like who should be making this, this these decisions and um going back to the kind of digital online conversation often people are saying oh this is actually a great time to get people um online and kind of commenting on planning applications or commenting on kind of what's changing in their neighborhood because it's more democratic but again it comes back to the fundamental question we started with is actually who has access to online spaces but then also could you argue the other way that this actually enables more people to engage with the built environment in a way that they don't usually because there's always the same like person who, screaming in the room you know when yeah, you've got, but I guess like who's at work to like still who aren't able to engage. A lot of people don't have more time, I guess, in this, in lock, during lockdown. A lot of people have like less time. You know, people, I guess, are being asked to work longer hours if you deliver parcels or if you like work in certain places, actually they're working longer and harder. So I guess that idea that, I guess it's one perspective to say that people have more time to engage in that collective action, but in a lot of ways people, potentially people have less time. And actually maybe it is a time to pause processes to allow people to get back to, um, some sort of rhythm of routine maybe now isn't the best time to start um, mm. doing extra engagement but I guess Akil you do a lot of engagement so what's your view on like um, whether now is a good time to engage people or not yeah I mean I think it's a fantastic question and actually to be honest I'd really like to hear Charlene's view on this as well because I'm, I'm coming at it from someone who I come from you know what we do is bringing it's bringing people into space together so that's exactly what cannot be done during lockdown um, so I'm coming at it from a completely different angle. Our angle isn't a tech angle, and we've been forced into a digital world. Like Mel's on the chat now; she can she can testify for that. And then us having to be forced to adapt to this kind of desktop life. So I think I don't know about the kind of um, the philosophical question whether or not now is the time to engage. And like the the broad spectrum of opinions that I've picked up from when we did the, uh, the AF talk and from when we did a bunch of other things um, was like that the, the, the spectrum is there's from the idea that you might dilute the, the um what you're able to do in the relationship that you have with the local community by engaging now when you actually can't when your hands are tied behind your backs so bad engagement might taint 
like a, a kind of reputational or trust bond that which is really important. Um, and then the other end is that by disappearing um, in this period where people need you the most, mm. you know, who, 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 you know uh, what does that say of your relationship? So I think it's, it's, it's super difficult. You know, we, the projects that we still have um, aren't really there because of the need to, to be there. They're there because of the organizational structure of the project. Um, you know what I mean? So various political reasons and all sorts of things are keeping us there. It's not because, and then, but, and the same can be said for the projects that we've lost. We've lost them because of the, the organization of, of those, those organizations can't afford to have them during these periods. So it's, uh, again, it's just, I'm, I'm not giving any, any like proper straightforward answers. I'm sure people are annoyed with me. I'm just giving super fluffy answers, but like, you know what I mean? But uh, anyway, Charlene, I, I actually really like to hear your, your opinion on that, on that respect. I think you're on mute. Charlene, you're on mute. Am I, is that better? Yeah. yeah. That's better. Okay. Um, so I've had similar experiences um, to you in so far as like, so lots, even though I'm looking at tech, a lot of the actual events and programs that I've been working on have been about people congregating physically. Um, and so the option's been to either try and recreate that through like a Zoom kind of using like Miro workshops and doing things like that way, um, or to just pause the project altogether. And what I'm finding personally is that trying to kind of get people to congregate and engage in like a digital space is not producing the same kind of results. Because A, I think we are all just very like, we've grown tired of it as lockdowns kind of continued. And also to fully engage people, like quite a lot of technical understanding is needed on like all sides. So like if you want people to know how to like put up a um, post-it note on a particular program, you need to teach them how to use that program. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, all of this kind of assumed knowledge is actually really restricting people's ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Um, ironically, I'm finding like operating in a digital world um, quite problematic. Mm. And I'm also finding that has been a social norm. Actually, it's it's like embedded a lot in, in like everything that happens in society. And actually, this is my worry. I guess is that the digital space just further doubles down on social norms. <coughs> and when you've got like inequality baked into like mm. our society, these things aren't going to like find themselves out unless we deal with it in every setting, whether digital or physical or structurally. And I guess systems are systems whether they're digital or physical um and ultimately i feel like uh um yeah the digital will just mimic everything else it just it can it can it can exasperate and i think i guess the, the positive i'm trying to be positive the positive now i guess is that you the abilities the ways that people mobilize collectively the like things like whatsapp allow people to do like, obviously putting the data issues aside but you know 20 years ago you couldn't whatsapp like 100 people and say we're all going to meet at the park to like play football or to do this. So there are, I guess there's ways of like, I guess I'm interested in how the digital could potentially in, enable more physical interaction, like in the city, by the ability for people or messages to revolve around things much quicker, and the ability for um, messages to be spread. But I still think that ultimately the physical space is where you actually are able to like make that change. Mm. They're like, I guess I've been interested by like lots of people on Instagram resharing posts around like um, the deaths of um, George Floyd and people like that in America. But actually, it was only when people took to the streets did you actually get those reactions. Because I guess I'm interested in a lot of digital public spaces curated. So you allow, you pick who you want to occupy that space. Whereas if you're walking down the street, you just see everyone. Or if you're in, if you're occupying Chicago Square, you can't like curate the people that might be there as tourists or you can't mm. create those things around you. So I guess it's mm. like mm. until all the digital space enforces you to necessarily like allow other people in that necessarily that you don't pick. So you can remove mm. followers on Instagram, you pick who you want to see. Mm. Whereas if I walk down the high street, you know, I have to see everyone. And I guess until like the digital realm mimics that, yeah. um, then I guess it's like I don't really see how we're gonna have like a like a positive transformative impact on society. Yeah. 
So, okay, <laughs> let's let's play your music your tune. tune. Yeah. Oh, yeah, do you want to tell us why you've chosen this tune? We've got, got that much time. Actually, before you do talk about why you want to choose a tune, uh, everyone who's listening in can, uh, in the chat box, just give your recommendations for uh, what tune you think relates to the themes you've been talking about today. Uh, yeah, it would be great to hear from you. But, Akil. For sure, yeah. So, this one was really about, I got asked about the collective action and thought like what's what's more kind of reflective of collective action than the time in 2004 where the South came together in a madness <laughs> over the East London grime hegemony. <laughs> but actually, to be fair, if, if, if anyone, if anyone's listening and, it, as, and I'll, I'll try not to be too whimsical about this, like, so South Side All Stars weren't an actual group. They were just part of a thing that was happening in Grime at the time, early 2000s, where people were getting together and doing big things. Like East London had a thing that was organized by Jammer called... <laughs> who said East London? Who brought for East London? Who did that? Was it Jaden? <laughs> I don't want to hear that. Not right here. Not right here. <laughs> Not right here. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> it's called like disruptive TV. I can't remember what Jammer's one was called. It doesn't matter. But it, this one was a South London one, and uh, I think there were something like sixteen different MCs on there. They're all from like really random parts of South London, all the way from really far Bexley Heath to like kind of really far west Richmond's kind of sides. Um, and it was also to put it in context. It was during a time when no one would think like grime was a very East London thing. Grime was not a South London thing. Um, and like our uh, grime artists who are famous in South London aren't famous in London or aren't famous on the kind of historical grime scene. So this was very much a kind of collective gathering of, and, and, and also bear in mind, this is 2004. So, you know, gang wars is on the up, like knife crime is also like rising very, very quickly. Um, so we're at loggerheads with one another, like this is the whole kind of gully guards divide in the South. So Peckham, Brixton kind of thing. Like, it's not like we're not a united front. Um, and so this moment to choose to unite, well, that's quite a powerful one. Um, and and unfortunately done so in in the context of trying to unite against someone else, but you know done nevertheless. So it was it was actually um, it was actually a really big moment. So I, I won't chat anymore, and I'll, I'll let you man enjoy the tune. That's the most beautiful introduction to Grand Tune I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you were, uh, I feel like you used to, used to like bring back Channel U. <laughs> honestly though, honestly, oh, there's also there's a Dan Hancock's. I think Dan Hancock wrote about this in like yeah. 2016 or 17 about this tune. So if you if you're interested, check it out. <laughs> the thing about that though is that every single one of those South London MCs would have been absolutely buffied by Getz or like DWE. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Anyone well, well, why not? That's that. That's <laughs> like that, anyone. Yeah. We don't talk about this. We don't talk about this. But you know. But uh, yeah, actually, no, to be fair, let me weigh in on that. Let me weigh in on that. Because... World Cup. <laughs> that's true. It? What was East London reply? So Jammer organised a little East London thing, but also bear in mind that at this time East London are big, man. You were, like <laughs> Wiley, Wiley paid yeah, you Wiley like, for everyone. They were a, a thing. Like they were, them were famous. I grew up in Stratford. I know. Asha D. Asha D. <laughs> famous person in this whole cup. <laughs> everyone else lives lives with their mums, bro. Is it? South, <laughs> we had we had Roots Manuva instead. <laughs> we had Roots Manuva. We had the hip hop thing. Yeah, we had Black Swan. Yeah, we had Kanye. And you had like so solid, which kind of like led the way. If you know yeah, what I mean. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we tell. Yeah. That's what we tell. We <laughs> give you subletting their flats and. And we had very side G's, but no one wants to hear about that. But anyway, <laughs> was yeah. it Lethal Bizzle Sal? Was more fire crew Sal? No, Lethal Bizzle's pal, man. He's um, he's like Bo or something. Oh. Like, Heck yeah, he's Hackney, I think. Crazy. Yeah, so this is perfect lockdown lock-in chat. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't, um, all right, so I actually can't see anyone's chat because I'm sharing the screen. So it's, yeah, it's, everyone's too scared to follow that, honestly. Well, I mean, uh, if there's any audience questions or comments or feedback, if just not, just like can... yeah. Um, oh, perfect. So we're running late. So let's just run on to the last mm -hmm. tune. Yeah, we are really late, actually. Yeah. Do you want to? Um, this is you, Joe, isn't it? This is me. So, uh, so the outro tip is to keep getting your nanny to, the sav to do the savage challenge instead. Um, potentially, we're going to do a lockdown lock-in after this. So we're just going to lock the chat and then play tunes and then people can talk and do whatever they want whilst we run songs. So it'd be like a... For a bit. It's like trying to, yeah, it's trying to mimic like real life. Like after an event, you go to the pub and have a conversation or you, yeah, you know, I don't know, do, it, do like something collective. So we're going to do something that's informal after this and like stop sharing the screen and stuff. 
But I guess what's really interesting to me is that, like, I'm not on TikTok, but I've been reliably informed by a source that um, it's like the big thing. And I guess I'm interested that um, there's like a mimicking of like ex- like normal like just like cultural appropriation that, that happens in pop culture that also happens on TikTok. So there's someone in this video, um, I think she's a white lady, who's one of the most famous people on TikTok, but she eventually took her dance moves from a black woman who hasn't got any recognition, which is like the by old like um, history of like um, pop culture, I guess. So, you know, and I've always like, wondered like, why is that a thing? And, like, and I think like, I've, maybe I've, I, mean, I haven't cracked it yet, but I find it interesting that this has mimicked itself from like, from ever, like, you know, like someone like Ed Sheeran sells loads of records singing like basically like sort of like what Craig David did before like, Craig David was popular. But I guess it's like kind of an interesting thing about how like whenever you see um like it's I don't know what it is, but or like Eminem being like the biggest selling rap artist of all time. And like how whenever um someone with fair complexion manages to achieve what a black person has achieved, suddenly they become really famous. And I guess I'm interested in why that's a thing. Then I find really interesting that Megan the Stallion, whose song of this is and then captured the best moment of people doing the Savage Challenge and then low flipped it and then loaded it as their like official music video for the song, which then gets to me something interesting around like, well, who owns these people who've done the Savage Challenge? Do they have to get agreement to this? Could they just take it because they're power into the world? Who owns this like content? And the fact that like Megan Thee Stallion and Beyonce, whose song it is, are now people who watch this on YouTube, all the proceeds then go to COVID-19 response in Houston. It's quite an interesting way of like flipping, I guess, something that people people have like taken up this like savage challenge. They've done it. There's a kind of is, is, like issues around like cultural appropriation, and the creators of the song have taken that content back, and they're using people's interest in it to provide funding for a charity in Houston to um, to support people's lives um, affected by COVID nineteen. I just find it like, quite interesting that this is all played out during lockdown, um, and I feel that like this is the most like lockdown video because it's people in their homes. You get to see where people live. They couldn't film the actual music videos. So they've had to do this. And it has issues about people getting credit for stuff they don't necessarily deserve to do. So but this looks like a bunch of teenagers dancing, but I assure you it's more complex than that behind the scenes. Um, so let's go. Also the other thing is it's interesting. The video is basically shot for iPhone, which again is another interesting like feature, like move on about how like, you know, the medium in which we, we absorb culture shifting from like this kind of widescreen TV to like portrait mm. like phones. I also find interesting. Let's begin. Um, what's your reaction? Have you seen that before, any of you, like Charlene and Nikhil? I have no. Like, what's your immediate? I feel like it's quite a weird. Oh, wait a sec. Let's unmute you. And I, what do you think? I find, I find that one of the weirdest music videos I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know who's been exploited anymore. <laughs> I know one. exactly. It's just too too much, too much. I think this is the whole a whole this is gonna open a huge can of worms. I think we should let's kind of switch up and like um finish this and then we can start playing some tunes and chat about yeah. it. So mainly just to say thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene and Akil. Really lovely to have you and your expertise and your thoughts. And it's like, these are the conversations that Joseph and I have been having quite a lot. So it's really nice to actually have you and your expertise um, contribute to this. Uh, thanks to the Architecture Foundation for hosting us. Thanks for you guys to listening in. As we said before, Friday, it's hot. We're allowed to like go and get pissed in parks now. So thanks so much for and coming. Have barbecues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With six as people. Long as you go one way around the barbecue and you don't share condiments, apparently. Um yeah, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. So 